Hello, I'm Chelsea Klein. I'm the new Executive Director of End of Life Choices New York. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to the Faith Sommerfield Family Foundation for funding our live streaming and our filming for this evening. This will be available on YouTube after the event so you can, you can rewatch and share with your friends and your family. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for gathering to, to educate yourselves and hopefully to share what you've learned this evening. We are here to learn more about me the Medical Aid and Dying Act. We are here because we've been pushing for medical aid and dying for a long time now. And we know that social change takes time and that we're not going to give up. We're here because we love living, because we love our lives, because we love each other, and we love our autonomy. I want to share an excerpt from one of my favorite poems, which is called Joy by Billy Collins. It is not often that I see the sun rise and set on the same day as I did the other day. It is easy to tell you, it is easy to tell which is which, even if you just emerged from a coma. The rising is a theater of silvery air and the setting done and imbued by gold. On the morning I'm thinking about, it rose over the low cluster of clouds then burst forth and lit up the sunny side of everything. And when it went down, it went down in a cauldron of molten metal and seemed to shudder in a foundry of its own making. What a brazen wonder to be alive on earth amid the clockwork of all this motion. What a joy to be alive amid the clockwork of all this motion. Many of us know firsthand that there is no joy in suffering. We know there is no joy in watching someone that we love suffer, which is why we cherish our autonomy and we fiercely protect our ability to control our bodies and our decisions, our fates, and to support our loved ones in controlling their bodies and their choices, their autonomy, their, fate, their fates. And we are profoundly grateful to our elected officials who fight to protect those things. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge our board members that are in the room, if they can stand or wave. We have quite a few board members here that have been with us for a long time. If you want to look around, if you stand up and say hello to us, we have some great board members that have been working on this for a long time. Thank you. It is a tremendous honor for me to introduce this panel tonight, um, and I, I will introduce them in the order in which they are speaking. Um, so we have a, a board member tonight who will be um, welcoming you, Susan Nobel. She is a longtime board member, and she will come up in a minute and welcome you. And we also have David Levin, who is our Executive Director Emeritus and also our Senior Consultant. And he's been working on this issue for about 17 years, and, and he's been a, a pretty amazing champion um, and, and an, an expert. Um, we also have Assembly Member Amy Pollan. Um, she's been a member of the Assembly since 2001. She is the Chair of the Assembly Committee on Corporations, Authorities, and Commissions, and she is the lead Assembly Sponsor in the Medical Aid and Dying Act. And we have Assembly Member Richard Gottfried, who's uh, been a member of the Assembly since 1970 and the Chair of the Assembly Health Committee since 1987, and he is a sponsor of the Medical Aid and Dying Act. And we also have Barbara Backer, um, who is Professor Emerita um, at the Department of Nursing at the Lehman College of CUNY. Um, so thank you for being here. And with that, I will introduce Susan Nobel. Uh, as you know, this is the fourth annual Barbara Swartz event. And on her deathbed, literally, Barbara asked her husband to donate even more funds to end-of-life choices. So I want to talk a, a little about Barbara, but before I do that, I'd like to introduce her husband, Knut Eric Rosenkrantz. Will you stand up? Stand up, Knut. <laughs> and I, I will say that Knut is also a very generous contributor to our organization. So I'll tell you a little about Barbara, and it is a little because she has a very long story. 
Uh, Barbara was a lawyer. She specialized in civil rights, poverty, criminal law, and in later years focused on law and medicine. You still okay in the back with my voice? Okay, thanks. Uh, she taught at NYU and Truro. She ran a summer program in Berlin uh, about human rights. And she decided late in life to become a mediator, feeling that mediation was a far better way to settle disputes than in the courtroom. And patients' rights were her professional and personal focus, which of course is appropriate for being on our board. In 1985, Barbara had acute kidney failure. She was on dialysis for 11 years, and in 1996, received a cadaver donation of a kidney from an anonymous donor who was a Canadian nurse who lived in New York. Uh, some of us on the board went to the 10th anniversary celebration of Barbara's kidney, and it was a fantastic occasion. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, the kidney served Barbara for 18 years, which is a rather amazingly long time. And Barbara died in July 2014. So she was a very active, active board member. Uh, she always had ideas, and her judgment was always very, very appreciated and excellent. But I think the best thing that Barbara did for us was to introduce us to David Levin, who became our executive director and held the job for 14 years. David. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, so I'm just tall enough, I think, to stand here. Sorry that you're not, Susan. Maybe you'll still grow. <laughs> so it's, it's so nice to see so many of you out this evening, given the fact that the weather is not as good as it might have been. Uh, but still, we have important things to talk about this evening. Uh, life is precious, but it is going to end for all of us, including 150,000 New Yorkers every year. Every dying person who is mentally competent should have the right to die if possible in accordance with his or her own values and beliefs. Medical aid in dying should be an available option. When does it occur? It occurs when a terminally ill, mentally competent adult patient who is likely to die within six months takes prescribed medicines which must be self-administered to end suffering and achieve a peaceful death. At End of Life Choices, we have studied medical aid in dying very carefully for almost two decades. We have learned a great deal. Here are some of the things that we now know. Most importantly, we know that when medical aid in dying is an open legal practice, appropriately regulated, it is a safe, humane, ethical medical practice that benefits patients and family members and causes no harm to anyone. A half century of cumulative evidence from states that permit medical aid in dying conclusively shows that the laws have worked as intended. We know that medical aid in dying is not suicide. This is important because many opponents argue that patients who seek to end their lives with prescribed medicines are suicidal and want to die. But suicides are committed by those who could, could live but choose not to, generally by people with mental illness. They are committed in isolation, often impulsively and by violent means, and they are tragic. To the contrary, medical aid in dying is available only to terminally ill patients who will soon die. Their disease is what's killing them. The process usually takes several weeks. It occurs always after consultation with two physicians and almost always with family support, and it is empowering. The term assisted suicide is rejected by the American Public Health Association, American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, American Medical Women's Association, among other organizations. In a 2000 statement 
by the American Association of Suicidology entitled Suicide is Not the Same as Physician Aid in Dying, 15 points of distinction are made between medical aid in dying and suicide. The executive summary states in part, the American Association of Suicidology recognizes that the practice of physician aid in dying is distinct from the behavior that has been traditionally and ordinarily described as suicide, the tragic event our organization works so hard to prevent. Although there may be overlap between the two categories, legal physician-assisted deaths should not be considered to be cases of suicide and are therefore a matter outside the scope of the work of the American Association of Suicidology. One of the 15 points states very cogently, the term suicide may seem to imply self-destruction and the act may be cast that way in some cultural and religious traditions. Ending one's life with the assistance of, of a phys physician and with the understanding of one's family is often viewed more as self-preservation than self-destruction. Acting to die while one still retains a sense of self and personal dignity before sedation for pain or the disease itself takes away the possibility of meaningful interaction with those around one. What else do we know about medical aid in dying? We know that there's no evidence of disproportionate impact on any vulnerable populations, the elderly, the poor, people with disabilities, people of color. There is no evidence of coercion of, or abuse of people with disabilities as reported by the Executive Director of Disability Rights Oregon. We know that people who access medical aid in dying have at least as good and in most cases better deaths than those who die by other means. And medical aid in dying, deaths are generally quicker and more peaceful, a better option for some patients. We also know that family members of those who request medical aid in dying feel better and accepting of the death of their loved one. And there are no negative effects. We know that while hospice is excellent and relieves the suffering of the vast majority of those who are dying, it cannot relieve the suffering of all the dying. Consider the excellent op-ed piece in the Sacramento Bee by Ann Jackson several years ago. She was the former CEO of the Oregon Hospice Association and initially an opponent of Oregon's medical aid and dying law. And she wrote about how her mind was changed over the years. She said, and I quote, it was arrogant of me to believe that hospice and palliative care professionals could meet all the needs of the dying, end of quote. And that, quote, even with the best care, some patients suffer intolerably, end of quote, end of quote. And we know this since over 90% of those who end their lives by medical aid and dying in Oregon are receiving hospice care. Contrary to what was expected by opponents, we know that medical aid in dying is rarely used, only in about four in 1,000 deaths, but that it gives great comfort to thousands of others who know the option is available. We know, too, that the momentum is on our side for those who support medical aid in dying, with nine states now permitting it, including New Jersey and Maine, which enacted laws just this year. In New York, the public supports medical aid in dying by over a two to one margin. And every demographic group supports it, regardless of political affiliation, race, age, gender, and religion, except for the people who attend religious services once a week or more. And while the medical profession is still divided on the issue, nationally, physicians support medical aid in dying by an almost two to one margin, 57% to 29% per a 2000 Medscape poll, and in New York, physicians support the Medical Aid in Dying Act by more than a three to one margin, 67% to 19% according to a 2018 poll. Finally, we know that none of the problems that opponents feared have emerged and there are no longer any compelling arguments against medical aid in dying which would outweigh the powerful arguments for it. Too many New Yorkers are now ba dying badly with unbearable suffering. They deserve better and should have the option of medical aid in dying, a better way of dying for the small number of patients who might choose it. The New York State Legislature must take action now. As Governor Cuomo recently stated, pass the bill. Uh, we have postcards on the table uh, near the um, entrance. 
uh, please take several, send them to your legislators, give them to others to uh, fill out and send to, to legislators as well. Uh, we need to gain support for this bill if it's going to be enacted. Thank you very much. And I've been going to Albany to meet with legislators for four decades now uh, in different capacities. Um, and I will tell you that tonight we are extraordinarily fortunate to have two of the very best legislators with us. They are both extremely hardworking, progressive, and productive legislators who are just wonderful to work with. It is my pleasure to introduce Amy Pollan, who is my assembly member in Westchester, who will speak first, and Dick Gottfried. Amy is the lead sponsor of the Medical Aid and Dying Act, as Chelsea mentioned, uh, and has been really exceptional to work with for the last five years or so now. Uh, we're gonna get this done in another year so we don't have to work on this bill together any longer. It's been, it's been long enough. Um, Dick Godfrey, Godfrey has chaired the Assembly Health Committee for decades. Uh, he's a staunch supporter of the bill, and both he and Amy have been so instrumental in strengthening the bill over the past few years to make it more acceptable to some who are skeptics and some opponents as well. Dick has introduced a number of other pieces of legislation for end-of-life choices in New York over the years, for which we are very, very grateful. Uh, and several of these bills have actually been enacted into law, uh, despite the fact that for years we had a uh, Republican who chaired the uh, Senate Health Committee. Please welcome first Assembly Member Amy Pollan. Thanks, Dave. So you might be wondering why someone who chairs the Corporations Committee is the lead sponsor. Well, I'll start with the short answer is, you know, everybody, of course, uh, encounters the issue that we're talking about tonight. The long answer is my bio, so um, you don't have to read that. So the, you know, I want to, um, Dave and uh, another friend who was lobbying, I think still is lobbying, for uh, this bill came to me probably more like seven years ago and asked me to consider being the lead sponsor for for this bill in, in New York. And I have to say when I was um, first asked, I had not any familiarity with the politics, with the substance, uh, what was happening around the country, and said, do I really want to take on something that seems, at that point in time, a little extreme? I think Oregon had been the only, or was the only state at that point that had a law. And you know what Oregon does doesn't necessarily mean the rest of the country follows. So I was a little reluctant and asked my, uh, my staff at the time, what do you think? And they were very, very enthusiastic about supporting the bill. And I said, okay, tell me why. And they went and they did some research uh, which convinced me to begin the process of, of, you know, of writing and working with my colleagues to develop what we now have as the Assembly Bill, uh, Senate Bill. And then I lived it. At the same time, uh, and I had made, I didn't make the connection until until um, years later. My sister was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Alongside her illness, again, not making the connection to the bill, I was busy developing the bill. And you know, she went into remission, everything was great, and then her cancer returned uh, about five and a half years ago. That long, very long year until her death was agonizing. And when I visited her, Toward the end, she was in hospice. We knew she was dying. We knew it was the end. She was in excruciating pain and yet fought the pain in order to be able to talk to her sisters, to be able to talk to her husband, to be able to talk to her children. And the choice was excruciating pain and communicating 
or relieving the pain and essentially being in a vegetated state. I remember about a week before she died, uh, that was the last time I saw her because I could not be with her at the end. I lived too far away. Uh, we don't, you don't know exactly when the end is going to be there, um, even though they uh, were not giving her any more food or um, meds. She fought uh, till the end, but she yelled at the end when I did see her, let, tell them to let me die already. I want to die. I can't take it anymore. And so I know that many of you have had similar experiences. I uh, had the, I don't know many of you, but already some of you have come over and gave me stories that I can uh, use, and I appreciate that. Anybody that's lived through it knows that it's not uh, something that you want anybody else that you love to go through, and it, it's something that you yourself don't want to have to go through. You want to be able to choose when you die, and you should be able to do that. So some of you here are already advocates, are already here because you want to learn more to be able to help the cause. Some of you are here because you want to you're, you're contemplating whether you want to be an advocate for the bill. Um, so I'm going to um, give you some information now because uh, I think by the end of tonight, you will all be advocates. And the tools you need to fight those who are opposing it are right in the legislation. So without the detail of the legislation, and I know this is going to be the most boring part of the evening, but I still want to go through it because I want you to listen uh, to those components of the, of the legislation that you can use in your advocacy. Because we need you on the ground being those advocates to your neighbors, to your friends, to be able to turn this around. We need the momentum that comes from the community. So. Our bill allows mentally competent, terminally ill adults 18 and older to request medication that will allow them to end their suffering and have a peaceful death, a death with dignity. In drafting this legislation, we were very aware that any law about life, death, and patient suffering had to have the input and support of a wide range of people. Most importantly, those who are facing a terminal illness and those who have been touched to the core by seeing someone you love die an unbearable death. We also needed input from professionals in the medical field, clergy, advocates, and professional organizations. We had to make sure that there was necessary safeguards an individual, if an individual elected aid in dying. The bill is very specific as to who and under what circumstances an individual can end one's life to prevent abuse and to provide legal protections to physicians, healthcare providers, and healthcare facilities. The momentum for allowing aid in dying is growing. Aid in dying legislation has been authorized in 10 states and jurisdictions, including California, Colorado, Montana, Oregon, Vermont, Washington State, Hawaii, New Jersey, Maine, and Washington, DC. Recent polls have confirmed the shift in attitude over the past several years. Dave mentioned those. People are talking about this issue in community forums, church gatherings, college people of all ages, and we're here to testify uh, wherever you need us to go. Aid and dying may not be for everyone, but it is an option that should be available to all New Yorkers, and it's why I'm committed to working with you and all of my colleagues to get this bill to the floor of the assembly this year and on the governor's desk. Essentially, the legislation would allow terminally ill adults to request that their attending physician prescribe them medication to allow them to end their suffering and to have a peaceful death. It would provide a primary physician, consulting doctors, healthcare facilities, and other witnesses with immunity from civil or criminal liability. The intent of the bill is to allow terminally ill patients to choose the time, place, and manner of their death and to allow healthcare professionals to provide them with the means without incurring liability or professional disciplinary action. The specifics, the patient must be 18 years old or older and have a terminal illness. A terminal illness is defined as an illness that will, within reasonable medical judgment, result in death within six months 
whether or not the patient receives treatment. Simple advanced age or disability are not sufficient to allow someone to qualify for aid in dying. There are many requirements set out in the legislation that serve as safeguards to ensure that only mentally competent, terminally ill patients who ask voluntarily and without coercion for medication to end their lives can obtain the medication. Let me highlight some of the safeguards. First, the terminally ill patient must make an oral request and a written request to his or her attending physician. The written request must be signed and dated by the patient and two adult witnesses in the patient's presence. The bill is very specific as to who can witness. They can't be related to the patient by blood, marriage, or adoption. Someone at the time of the request can't be entitled to a portion of the patient's estate under a will or by operation of law. An owner, operator, or employee of the healthcare facility where the patient is receiving or treating um, or uh, uh, receiving treatment or residing, and the patient's attending physician, consulting physician, or applicable, the mental health professional who determines whether the patient has capacity cannot make, cannot be a witness. These witnesses must attest to that the best of their knowledge and belief, the patient has capacity. We provide um, and we make sure that there are interpreters for people who um, cannot speak English so that they can make a wise decision and we are ensured of their decision. Second, the attending physician, um, defined as a physician who has the primary responsibility for the care of the patient, is responsible for doing things before he can write a prescription. So the, patient, the physician must determine that a patient has the, ter the terminal illness, must testify um, uh, in their medical documentation that they've made the request voluntarily and without coercion. They must refer the patient to a mental health professional if the physician believes that the patient lacks capacity to make an informed decision. It must provide information and counseling regarding palliative care. Inform the patient that he or she can rescind the request for medication at any time and in any manner. Fulfill that the fulfill the medical record documentation, which is quite extensive, is all in the in the in the patient's file. In addition, a second physician, a consulting uh, physician, must reaffirm every single thing that the uh, original attending physician, primary physician, had done. And if either the attending physician or the consulting physician believes that the patient may lack capacity, they must refer the patient to a mental health professional who must determine that the patient has capacity. If the medical health professional determines that the patient lacks capacity, then they cannot give this medication. If all of the conditions that I've described have been met, then the attending physician may personally or by referral to another physician prescribe or order aid in dying medication. The patient may self-administer, must um, self-administer the medication to himself or herself. No other person can administer the medication to the patient. And if the requirements set forth in legislation have been followed, the physician, the pharmacist, other healthcare professionals will be immune from civil and criminal liability and disciplinary and professional discipline. There are other protections as well. For example, a physician, nurse, pharmacist, and other healthcare provider or other person may choose whether or not to participate. It doesn't require them that they do. Uh, a private health facility may prohibit uh, prescribing or dispensing, so they do not have to participate. No action that complies with the mandates of this legislation will be construed to con con to, or constitute suicide. So while we, um, we know that it's not suicide, the law actually says that it's not suicide. It's not attempted suicide. It's not mercy killing, and it's not homicide. Life insurance benefits cannot be denied. Uh, to the patient or his or her beneficiaries and the sale or issuance of a life or health insurance policy or the rate charged for a policy may not be conditioned or affected by a patient making or rescinding a request for medication. Insurers cannot provide any information and communications made to a terminally ill patient. You know, we heard that, you know, where the concern was that somehow it would be a benefit 
to the insurance companies to have this, so we were concerned, and we heard that people did not want them to be able to communicate or advance this, so we, we bar that provision, we bar them from doing so. The sale or issuance of professional malpractice insurance policy or the rate charged for the policy cannot be conditioned upon whether the insurer does or does not participate, and the health department must adopt regulations providing for the safe disposal of any unused medication. Lastly, we've built into the bill a reporting and review process. The health commissioner must review a sample of medical records annually and will prepare an annual report regarding utilization and compliance. And, you know, Oregon did this and it was to everyone's benefit because we were able to document that there was no abuses and we want to be able to document that in New York. The patient's death certificate who dies after self-administering um, aid medication will indicate the underlying terminal illness as the cause of death, and that is very critical as well. The bill was originally modeled after the Oregon bill. It represents the agreement reached with the advocates, Compassion and Choices, End of Life Choices New York, and the Senators Savino and Hoylman, uh, working closely, of course, with my colleague and good friend Dick Gottfried, who's chair of the Health Committee and co-sponsor of the bill. We continue to make improvements to the bill, to update the bill, to look at every single bill that's passed in every other state and jurisdiction, to take the best we can to advance this in New York. And, you know, I, I'm happy to answer questions uh, at the end of the program. Thank you so much. Well, good evening. Um, so Amy has done a really terrific job of uh, describing this bill to you and uh, uh, as well as uh, giving us a sense of what this issue has meant uh, in her life. Uh, you know, end of life issues are always very difficult for the legislature in New York, and I would imagine uh, in every other state uh, to deal with. Um, and it's easy, to, I, th I think, to understand why. Uh, there's obvious uh, uh, finality to decisions uh, about end of life. Uh, ask any life insurance salesperson who will tell you that people don't like to think about uh, these issues. Uh, people are scared. Uh, people think about all sorts of, uh, you know, plots that uh, Agatha Christie could uh, weave around uh, uh, any of these issues. Um, you know, the, while the, the, the health care proxy law, uh, which I was the sponsor of in, in Albany, uh, which allows you to designate someone to make, end, to make healthcare decisions for you if you lose mental capacity. That law passed in about a year or two uh, after it was introduced. Um, I'm still not entirely sure how we were able to get that done. I've got a couple of thoughts that relate to some of the personalities involved. But the next step in the legislation, the Family Healthcare Decisions Act, that enable, that if, says that if you have not designated a healthcare agent to make decisions for you and you lose capacity, then members of your family uh, can make end of life decisions, uh, termination of life sustaining treatment uh, decisions for you. We were, I think, the 48th state in the union uh, to enact uh, such legislation. Um, we are often either the first or the last state to do a lot of things. We were the, the last state in the union to legalize the sale over the counter of reading classes. Um, um, another Gottfried bill, by the way. Um, um, but the Family Health Care Decisions Act took 17 years to get enacted. Um, which were, I, I still almost come to tears when I think about that process. It was the most obnoxious 
part of my legislative career, and that's saying a lot. Um, <laughs> because uh, people were concerned about this, people were concerned about that. Uh, there were issues about what if the uh, patient is pregnant, and concerns about, uh, you know, a, an early draft of the bill talked about spouses, and what about domestic partners? This was before we had same-sex marriage. Um, it just, it was endless. Um, but part of what was underneath all of that uh, was people's anxiety uh, about end-of-life issues. Um, so it, it, it's not a surprise to me that it has been like pulling teeth to get legislators to, uh, uh, to come on board uh, with the legislation. Um, to me, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a slam dunk. It, it just makes my blood boil to think that my government thinks it has the right to tell me that I don't have that right. Uh, now, yes, you want to, it is, it, it's part of government's job to prevent abuses. Uh, this bill has so many layers of protection in it that, frankly, uh, I mean, if this is kind of what they have in Oregon, it, it amazes me that, uh, that the law gets used in Oregon. Um, if anyone proposed applying all of this rigmarole to any other health-related topic, uh, people would be incensed. Um, but we have to have all of those, you know, layers of the onion uh, in order to get the bill passed because part of what enables us to bring people on board with the bill uh, is assuring them about uh, all of these layers of, uh, of protection. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the discussions I often have with people, I had it to see a couple of days ago with a, with a physician uh, who doesn't like the idea. And of course I said, well, if you don't like the idea, then when your patient asks you to write the prescription, say, sorry, no, I don't do that. Um, you've got that, you, you've got that right. Um, but I, I said, you know, under the law in New York, you can, as the phrase goes, pull the plug uh, for a patient who is on life support. They can tell you to do that. Uh, how is that different? And he said, well, when I pull the plug, that's not, I'm not killing them. It's their underlying disease that kills them. And I said, oh, yeah? So supposing some evil-minded enemy of that person sneaks into their hospital room and pulls the plug, and they get arrested for murder, and they say, oh, I didn't kill the patient. Their underlying disease killed the That person's going to sing sing for the rest of their life, believe me. Um, and to me, there, there really is no no moral difference. And we have accepted the proposition that people have the right for themselves or to have a, an agent or a family member uh, determined to withdraw life-sustaining treatment. Uh, to me, there is no moral or ethical difference uh, between that and, uh, and the right of every human being to say, uh, I can't take this anymore. Um, to me, that is about as fundamental uh, an element of humanity uh, as there is. And so uh, I hope that uh, between David and Amy and me and others who will speak this evening, uh, that those of you who may have arrived here uh, not convinced uh, will leave here convinced uh, and that you will all join in helping all of us to get this legislation enacted, to contact your legislators, uh, find out uh, where they stand on the issue, let them know where you stand on the issue. Uh, you know, people often wonder, you know, does that do any good? You know, I don't, 
they, they say, I'm not going to Albany with a suitcase full of, uh, uh, of cash. Uh, why would anyone listen to me? And I can tell you, I mean, I've been involved in health policy issues uh, in the legislature for 32 years now as, as health chair. This is a set of issues where we all, all of us, I think, in the legislature understand none of us is a doctor. Uh, none of us has all the answers. Uh, we're all basically human beings. I, I think that's in the Constitution. And we all like to be able to look at ourselves in the mirror in the morning uh, and convince ourselves that we're doing the right thing. And part of the way we can make that happen is when individual New Yorkers talk to their legislators, write them an email, write them a letter, meet them at a community meeting and talk to them. Uh, the guy who used to be head of the Amer American Academy of Pediatrics uh, here in New York State lives a, a block from me and somehow often when I was on my way to the subway, he would be out walking his dog um, and would chew my ear off, he, not the dog, um, uh, about whatever was, was on his mind. So there are, I'm sure he wasn't plotting that, uh, but it often worked out that way. There are ways you can relate to your legislator uh, at community meetings, writing letters and, and, and the like, and it's really important uh, on an issue especially like this uh, that legislators hear from, from all of you. Thank you. Our last speaker this evening is Barbara Backer. She is a professor emerita, as Chelsea mentioned, of nursing at Lehman College CUNY. She has been a wonderful supporter of End of Life Choices in New York, a fierce fighter for a good quality of life and expanded options for a good death, including medical aid in dying. She gave very moving testimony at the Assembly Health Committee hearing on medical aid in dying last year and we are very pleased to have her with us this evening. Please welcome Barbara Backer. Thanks, David. Uh, my colleagues this evening have spoken very eloquently and thoroughly on the proposed Medical Aid and Dying Act and why and how we can pass this act into legislation in the next coming session. This evening, I would like to illustrate and emphasize what is so crucial and paramount to me in this issue of legislating medical aid in dying, and that is having the availability to choose. I'd like to do this by sharing with you a very personal experience, which I hope will clarify why choice has been a significant part of my living with my cancer. I sit in a recliner chair, watching the clear liquid dripping into the vein in my extended arm. Around me sit seven other people, also in recliner chairs, all with various fluids dripping into their arms. Some of us read, others are on iPhones, laptops, some doze, some like me gaze, perhaps unfocused, into where? We are here for treatment of our cancers. For some, these fluids bring hope for a cure. For others, a remission. For others, relief from pain and or suffering. Although my cancer is incurable, I have Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, a very rare lymphoma. There are treatments that can stop its advancing for varying periods of time. I feel fortunate to have these as options. I choose to do this current treatment with this in mind. There exists in the room a palpable sense of camaraderie. Do you need a blanket? The handle to raise your feet is on the side of the chair. We seek to help 
to say in not so many words, perhaps if I can be useful, I may not be so sick after all. I am scheduled to repeat this scenario per my chemo protocol two days every month for six months. But my body creates its own protocol. I am constantly nauseated and am unable to eat much of anything and have constant fatigue. This response necessitates further IVs for hydration, so I become a frequent flyer in the chemo suite. My valiant and caring oncologist, Dr. S, works with me in modifying my chemo regimen. Other meds are prescribed to deal with the side effects. We titrate doses. I make choices about what I can tolerate or what seems like an impossibility to take. My veins disappear. I marvel at the kindness and skill of my nurses as they hunt for a spot to insert the IV needle. I am proud of my profession. Dr. S. does rounds every day to talk with each one of us about how we are feeling and to answer any questions we might have. His presence is reassuring. Somehow I invest in him a hope that this treatment will help, although I know it will be temporary. I sense that other people in the room are also feeling this, a chance to continue life their eyes are bright and their voices eager. It must be a tremendous burden for the doctor to bear this hope. I complete the fifth month of the chemo protocol and ask to stop. I am depleted and exhausted physically, mentally, and emotionally. I do not recognize myself. The quality of my life is non-existent and Dr. S. agrees to end the treatment. One of the indicators of my cancer, my IgM molecules, had lowered from the life-threatening number they had reached. I have bought some time. However, during the course of treatment, another important molecule in my immune system has been diminished, my IgG, which we all need to combat infection. Dr. S. suggests IV replacement of this to provide needed antibiotics, which I choose to do. The best way to make sure the IVIG has a variety of antibodies is to pool the human plaza, plasma from a lot of people, meaning these IV bags containing IgG antibodies from 10,000 to 50,000 healthy donors to obtain one dose. After my chemo experience, I approach any further IV treatment with much trepidation. But I am also feeling so much gratitude to those people who have donated their plasma to someone they don't and will never know. My fantasy is that I am now an international person, having received these infusions composed of the plasma from so many diverse people. Will I perhaps be able to finally speak another language fluently? <laughs> perhaps even several languages other than English. Fantasies can be fun. It has been a year now since I have completed chemo for my cancer. Dr. S has suggested further oral medication, medication for treatment, but I have chosen not to do that, at least not right now. I still feel as though I am recovering from the past experience and I'm trying to get back some quality of life in terms of strength, less fatigue, and eating while still being able to enjoy in a limited way the wonder, the preciousness, the sacredness, the mysteries of life. I realize a time is coming when I no longer will be able to have options for treatment, perhaps from resistance or intolerance to drugs, or perhaps from no longer be, excuse me, from no longer being able to manage my cancer along with maintaining an acceptable quality of life. However, I do know it would be extremely reassuring and comforting to know that when that time comes, 
I could make the choice to maintain medical aid in dying to have a peaceful and dignified death. People have a fundamental right to determination, self-determination with respect to their bodies and to control the course of their medical treatment. During the course of my chemotherapy, I continually made choices when to start, when to stop, what to take, what not to take. I think many of us in this room have probably made various choices as to medical treatment. For example, when to take a medication, when to have a procedure, perhaps when to obtain a second opinion. The Medical Aid in Dying Act recognizes and respects the inherent dignity and autonomy of each one of us and our ability to make our own choices. The Act does not impose this action on anyone. It simply adds to options already available, such as voluntary stopping eating and drinking and withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. It presents a choice. For many of us, being able to actively participate with our healthcare team in our dying is as significant as participating with them in our living. Medical aid in dying as law in New York will allow those people like myself to make the choice to have medical aid in dying and then to have the option to live a subtle miracle, a death with dignity and grace. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those are really, really amazing words. So we have some questions. This is your moment to give your cards to Renee, who will be walking around. This is also a good moment to talk about the three pillars of work that we do here at End of Life Choices New York. We have Judy Schwartz right up here in front, who is our clinical director, who provides free counseling to anyone who calls her, and also resources and referrals to people who call. That is one of the most um, incredible services that I've heard about, and that's one of the main things that drew me to doing this work, is to support her into continuing to help people that need her and her expertise. Um, we also have Ayana Woods um, somewhere in the back, who is our director of education and outreach. Reach. And she also works with our interns and our volunteers, and she helps to coordinate talks all over New York, libraries, senior centers, and helps people to learn how to fill out their advanced directives and to know what their rights are. Thank you very much. And we can't do this work without you and your support. We also have David Levin, I'm sorry, as, you, as I already introduced, um, who is our, one of our educators and also one of our main lobbyists and um, our, our, our oracle, as we call him, because he's so helpful. Um, so we have envelopes on your chairs. Thank you, Renee. Um, if you are willing, able, inspired to support our work, we would be most grateful. And there's a box on the back table. Um, and there's, you can also mail the envelopes to us. Um, so we have a lot of questions, my gosh. Um, so here is the first one. How can we respond to disability rights advocates who have reportedly been amo among the most staunch opponents of medical aid and dying? So medical aid and dying is only for people who are terminally ill. It's not for people with disabilities unless they also have a terminal illness. In addition, think about the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed almost 30 years ago now. That act was enacted in order to give people with disabilities the same rights as everyone else has, to hopefully ensure the same kind of access to programs and facilities like we all have, to make the same kinds of decisions as we all can make, et cetera. Now, there's no question that there has been historic discrimination against people with disabilities. And that discrimination continues today, including in the health profession. That's clear. But at the same time, there is simply no evidence that medical aid in dying in any way discriminates against people with disabilities, has a disproportionate impact on people with disabilities, nor has there been any evidence that there is any abuses or have been any abuses 
of people with disabilities in terms of coercion or exploitation or otherwise. Understandably, some in the disability rights community had legitimate concerns 20 years ago before there was any evidence about how medical aid and dying laws would in fact be implemented. But now with over 50 years of cumulative evidence from the various states which allow medical aid and dying, it's been shown that those concerns, while perhaps valid when they were first raised, no longer have any validity. So while we deeply respect our friends and colleagues in the disability rights community and understand that discrimination continues today against people with disabilities in so many different ways, there is just no evidence that there's any discrimination or any problems that have resulted as a result of people having access to medical aid and dying. Thank you, David. You know, I, I would add to that, you know, every state in the union uh, now allows family members uh, to make uh, decisions about withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment for family members who have lost capacity to, uh, to make their own health care decisions. Uh, at the time we were enacting that in New York, there were people in, uh, in the disability community, there were people in the uh, mental health community who were concerned that uh, people in their communities would be uh, devalued and railroaded uh, into having uh, loss of, of life-sustaining treatment. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard anyone since those laws have been enacted in New York or elsewhere uh, argue that that is in fact taking place. Uh, and I think that on top of 20 plus years of experience in Oregon and, and now in, in several other states uh, really ought to reassure people. And the, the procedural safeguards uh, that are in uh, the aid and dying bill, uh, the layers of, of consultation, et cetera, uh, that you have to go through uh, in order for, uh, aid and di for an aid and dying prescription to be written, and the fact that the that the patient himself or herself has to actually administer uh, the medication uh, if they choose to. No one can do it for them. Uh, uh, I think adds more layers of safeguard. And as Dave was uh, suggesting, you know, what what other medical right would people with, would advocates for people with disabilities tolerate being denied? Uh, to people with disabilities. Uh, and uh, to me, people have a right to be free from their government telling them uh, how to make this most profound decision, and they have that right uh, whether they are uh, physically able uh, or not. Thank you. So I will paraphrase a few of these, but there's a few questions about what are the current obstacles to passing the bill? And, and also which groups are preventing the passage, if you could speak on that a little bit. With any legislation, you know, sometimes I'm amazed and shocked that in one year's time I could get any bill done at all because, uh, you know, it, there's so many uh, obstacles generally in the legislature. So, you know, it's, it's uh, Civics 101. You know, it has to pass the Assembly, it has to pass the Senate, and the governor then has to sign it. Well, we know here that the governor has come out for this initiative, this bill. So, one down. We're working on the other two. That's really what we're doing. So, you know, you, that's why we're here. And that's why we want to encourage you to uh, help us with those messages. The obstacles are, the opponents are, you know, one was named, you know, many people in the disability community. That's a community 
that believes that they're going to be pressured into, um, uh, into taking this medication. So one of the things, you know, by hearing Dave and Dick, you know to ask that person uh, who's advocating against the bill on behalf of people with disabilities is why? You know, why do you think that? You know, do you want to be denied uh, an abortion because you're a person with disabilities? Do you want to be denied um, uh, cancer medication because you're a person with disabilities? Why would you want to be denied this? And why do you think you would have pressure under this circumstance. So that's, a, that's one of the obstacles, but the other is just purely our colleagues need to be convinced uh, to support it. We're near there, we're getting um, nearer, uh, but we're not there yet. Yeah, I, apart from people, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna talk about that. Um, I think Amy is right that the only constituency that I've heard people, my colleagues talk about uh, is opposition from some of the disability advocacy groups. Uh, unlike some other, unlike the Family Healthcare Decisions Act, for example, uh, yes, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church is opposed. Uh, yes, Agudath Israel, which is one of the innumerable voices of the Orthodox Jewish community uh, is opposed. Um, but I don't think I hear from our colleagues that, oh, I'd like to vote for this bill, but I hear the church is against it. I don't hear that. Uh, what I hear is just you know, their, their own personal fears uh, and arguments and, and concerns, not expressed as, you know, the, the church tells me this. Uh, they, may, they may be hearing it from the church, but unlike some other issues, I don't hear people saying, you know, my local priest will, you know, I'll never hear the end of it if I vote for this bill. Uh, I, I don't hear that on this topic. I think it's it's very personal concerns, which means this has got to be dealt with, you know, uh, very much on a retail uh, one by one basis. Um, one of the things I've encountered both with friends and colleagues and patients is that people have, they don't have the knowledge, I'm not saying the whole bill that Amy talked about, but they think it will be, when people hear the word legislation, they think it's something that must be done. And I think one of the things that's helpful is to present that is, is an option and it is their choice and that no one is imposing this on it. I think people are afraid that if something passes as a law, you know, then you must do it. But I think we have to really clarify that it is a choice and an option. There's a, a few questions in here about um, what, their op what the options are for people who lack the ability to self-administer the medication, if you would speak on that. Could you say that again? If someone is not able to self-administer medication after the bill is passed, what would happen? Uh, they would not be able to uh, take advantage of the bill. Uh, we have been lobbied, you know, both sides, right? Um, uh, we have been lobbied by uh, some advocates who are representing certain diseases where somebody cannot uh, self-administer. And, you know, we have not chosen to, to go there. Uh, no state, no municipal, none of the ten have. Uh, we would have much harder time passing a bill uh, that would allow that. So while we might uh, support it up here for uh, some of those people who are in a, uh, lack the ability to self-administer but fulfill every other um, uh, piece of the bill, you know, we have not chosen to am amend. It's hard enough where we're at now uh, than to add. Thank you. 
We also have a few questions about um, the Alzheimer's population of patients, um, whether in the early stages or in later stages. Um, can you tell us more about that? I think it's the same thing, uh, maybe even harder because you can't necessarily diagnose when someone with Alzheimer's is going to die within six months. It's not an easy diagnosis for a physician to make, and uh, that's one of the requirements in the bill. Could but I just say something about that, folks? <laughs> There's always other options. This bill isn't for everybody, and for those people who don't meet those requirements, there are always other options. So tell your friends that think this is just a narrow bill, and oh my God, what's going to happen if it doesn't apply to me? Call us. There are all these options and choices you can make. Okay. Thank you. The other aspect of the issue is not whether someone, necessarily whether someone is going to die of, of Alzheimer's, but a patient with Alzheimer's or dementia or any variety of other things that may, that may come to deprive them of their capacity to make decisions, uh, those patients come down with cancer uh, and any number of other uh, conditions that for other New Yorkers would entitle them uh, to choose medical aid and dying. Uh, for those patients, a family member can make decisions about withholding life-sustaining treatment. Under this bill, the family member would not be able to make a decision uh, about medical aid and dying. Uh, I would say that is an issue that really is going to have to be dealt with uh, after this bill has become law uh, and people can talk about what changes do we need to make in it. Great. Thank you. Um, this will be our last question for the evening. Um, it's about someone who suffers from chronic pain but does not have a terminal illness. How would this, if this passes, how would this help them and would it help them? Same answer. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> and thank you to our wonderful panel.